Yes, uh, welcome back to the second part of week one. Um, and I apologize, that this kind of makes week one a little longer than some of the other chapters, but um, chapter five goes pretty quickly, but it does kind of tie to that introduction um, because we're gonna be talking about the actual event booking process and scheduling and how that works. So, um, so this is part two of week one here, and we'll be talking about um, definitely about chapter five. So as we go along here, um, we'll be. So as the quote says, you know, and a facility definitely has to book events. That's what it's there for. Um, so if an event, if you don't have events in the facility, you're not making money and the building is actually costing you money. So you do want to keep that building if, as full as possible and ensure that you're making money and generating economic impact for the entire surrounding area. Um, because if you, you, um, for instance, um, there's many businesses outside of there that depend upon you, uh, making it on um, most of these are in kind of enter restaurant and entertainment districts um, that rely heavily on those events to really make their make their money. So if we take a look at the process, um, this is going back to the previous chapter where we talked about the life cycle of an event. Um, this happens in the first part of that event where we're um, after we've made the aspect of um, you know the viability of the event. Um, ensuring that we can actually make money. So um, in that in that in first process after we've assessed the viability of it, now we're going to go ahead and take a look at um, the actual booking, uh, you know, the actual bring the process to bring the event to the facility. So if you take a look at this, you're going to look at the scheduling. Um, as an event manager, you're you're really mass. There's a master schedule of events um that um we'll look at over a period of time so when you take a look at this um you're making sure that you as you're scheduling events that you've got enough time to turn the building over in between events um and how much that would cost if you were going to book events very very close together the booking is the execution of the actual scheduling plan um and it procures a con and involves a contract okay um so the difference is, you know, you have a, and a, the actual booking there is the actual contract part. Scheduling is just putting it on a schedule. Um, the booking is where you actually execute a contract um, and you actually make a permanent hold on that facility and blocking the space and the, agreeing upon a price. Um, and then you're making sure that you, um, as you're making that contract, these last three ones are ensuring that you have um, all these other stakeholders ready to go on um, looking at making sure that, you know, this doesn't violate your mission statement. Now in a public owned facility, um, and we'll get into the difference between public and private, um, pretty much anything is open there um, because there's not a lot of philosophical um, things that you can do um, because it is a public building. Uh, private entities have to do can can be a little more selective in the amounts they hold. Um, making sure that there's legal issues taken care of, you know, that your contract doesn't violate any of these noise ordinances or curfews or any of those types of things. Um, now, luckily, um, most public events or public facilities now are kind of located in entertainment areas, so the impact on um, noise ordinances and things like that are probably pretty slim. Um, so, but you still may have some considerations there. And then outside stakeholders, making sure that every, you know, that emergency services, security services, police, fire, all those types of things are on, on, on understanding um, what they're going to be expected to do, um, making sure that that's viable for them. Um, so these are things that we always look at when we're looking at an event. Um, as we look at that, each event, we're gonna be looking at each, as part of that process of establishing whether we want to book or not, we're gonna be looking at these couple of things um, and, uh, and in the analysis. The first one is going to be taking a look at um, what your primary market for that event would be, the secondary market, and then the tertiary market. Okay, so your primary market is going to be who you, um, you think that event is going to be is going to be marketed to. Now, secondary market basically is those people who might be sitting on the fence on uh, an event that might appeal to them, uh, 
them and trying to figure out how you can reach them and pull them in to make the, the different decision. The primary market is going to be those that you're going to go after. Um, you know, so for instance, a rodeo has a particular market. Um, that their secondary market are going to be those people who might be interested in it, or maybe um, as I was out west, you know, um, they bring school kids in to watch the rodeo and those types of things. That's kind of the secondary market. And then the tertiary market is going to be the, that last market of people out around the event. Um, you might be interested in, you know, possibly doing something with the event, but maybe not in primarily interested in the event. Um, so we, we need to look at those aspects and making sure that the event is viable for your area. Um, looking at things like, um, you know, and these are things that we're looking at, demographic, psychographic, um, characteristics of the event, um, transportation, lodging, or restaurants. Um, you know, that's the biggest thing, you know, my experience in Jacksonville was uh, the, the Super Bowl that was held there. Um, the league was not so happy with the aspects of the feedback they got from there was not so great on transportation. Um, transportation was okay, but the lodging and restaurants were not up to par to what they were expecting. So um, that's why it, um, Jacksonville has not been awarded the Super Bowl since then, although they could be in the future. Um, they, they're working on expanding and, and developing and it's becoming a more well-rounded city. Um, and then whether it's an outside event, um, especially that plays into it. Um, so when we take a look at the SWOT analysis, the actual SWOT analysis um, is things like capacity. Um, you know, is there, uh, do you have the capacity, do you have technology? Um, and these are the types of things where we take a look at. Um, you know, just um, in public buildings, it isn't too bad because you can ticket the event. Um, sometimes that becomes a more of a key in an open, um, uh, like a con outside concert or something like that, where you're, you're doing, um, not, a that's not, it's a ticketed event, but it's an open seating event. So it's, um, you know, they count for standing and all that, uh, those things. Capacity could become an issue at that point. Um, or a free concert, um, capacity definitely would become a, an issue. Um, multi-purpose facilities, um, technology capabilities. Okay. Making sure that you can. Um, offer what you need to for those um, facility staff on um, turnaround or changeover ability um, in between events. So we talked a little bit about that just a slide or two ago. In other words, that's the ability to turn the, the event around between um, between events, turn building around between events. Now, and I can tell you from an arena, we were scheduled pretty tightly when I worked in the arena. Um, so our turnaround time was pretty good, but sometimes, you know, you had to allow a day in between. Um, so for instance, if you had ice hockey, um, you know, the ability to turn that building around to ice hockey, either before or after, say, a concert event, um, you would need a day because you would have to uncover the rink. Um, so that could be done um, quickly overnight. Um, so you have to remove the flooring, and that took a day on either side. So that's an example of, of executing a turnaround event. Um, scheduling of specialized personnel. Um, so if you're contracting out, for instance, um, electricians um, or something along those lines, and they, you don't have the ability to get those electricians in, um, or they won't work overnight. Um, some electricians I've worked with, um, some of the electrical unions would work um, overnight. They would only work um, in the daytime hours, into the evening hours, and would not work overnight. So to turn that building around in between events, you might have um, to work that schedule in as well. Um, you know, uh, typically the way this works is um, facilities can receive a request for proposal. Um, and this is where you're in the driver's seat. Um, which means that you put out what you're willing to do and what your bottom line is and what the costs are, okay, um, in your request for a proposal. So if you're, if they're looking at bringing um, a multi-act concert series to a stadium, um, you can highlight what you, um, what the market would be. Um, and my experience in Jacksonville would be, you know, typically in Jacksonville, country sells, okay? And so you could bring a multi-act, you know, full day, evening concert of also country acts, and you would definitely be able to have that primary market wrapped up pretty well um, and make up and make money in a state. OK, um, other acts, um, it's hard to say. Yeah. You know, also, you probably would be able to do that with uh, some rappers and those types of things. Although I haven't seen that in that facility done yet, um, um, but it has happened in the amphitheater. So those are the types that you would put into a request for a proposal. So uh, you would put in for a proposal um, and then the promoter will decide which facilities they're going to use. Um, yeah, you know, these are some things that you have to consider, um, unfortunately, um, in the SWOT analysis. Okay, these are special considerations. Um, the National Rifle Association, if you want to book your for life of choice, you know, if a white supremacist group decides they want to book your facility, and a facility, you can't turn them down. Um, Black Lives Matter, um, religious events, um, uh, concerts, depending on the uh, targeted market. Um, all of these are special considerations where you have to look at things like outside security, um, law enforcement um, involvement, um, possibly crowd control. Um, the top ones, the top four, um, definitely would lead to some protests, um, encounter protests. 
um, outside of the facility as you're hosting these events. Um, even the fifth one, religious events, some of the religious events um, could lead, depending on the topic, could lead to that extra security issue. Um, and that's where um, they have to be willing to do that. Yeah, you know, other issues might be food requirements. And I can tell you from personal experience, one of my my events that was, um, luckily I wasn't responsible for it, but um, one of the events uh, in our arena that was poorly managed um, was they allowed a religious event to book out um, and then without a, guarantee, without a building guarantee. And they made a whole bunch of special requests for specialized food and those types of things and um, all these food outlets that were out. It's the only time in my career that um, we've closed concession stands um, and because it forced them to go to these alternative outlets and they didn't even come close to making their their building guarantee. Um, we lost um, in food and beverage um, over $40,000. Um, I was saying it was like $48,000 or $50,000 that, we, um, that weekend. Um, the building lost a lot more. Um, so it was a disastrous event. Um, but that's where you, you make sure you have those guarantees and those types of things to make sure that the event can go off as, as planned. Your last thing, one of these last things that you're going to take a look at in the booking process is tenant hierarchy. Okay. Um, this is user buildings that have primary tenants and sometimes there's more than one set of tenants. Um, for instance, um, you know, if you look at, um, the, uh, stadium where you have two football teams playing out of there. Okay. Um, there, there's two primary tenants, and they get the primary priority in scheduling um, events in and around the facility. Um, and sometimes it's going to it's an issue of which one is primary, which one secondary. Um, so you have to work through contractual issues of that. Um, in a in a, in, a, in an arena, for instance, you know, um, your primary may be basketball. Okay, you may have an anchor tenant that's um, a pro basketball team, but you have secondary tenants of ice hockey, um, possibly college basketball, um, you know, where they're, um, where they're playing all of their games there. So you have to work those around. And any extra events that you schedule have to work around both your primary and secondary tenants. Okay, you know, um, the booking, actual booking process is pretty much, you know, it's pretty cut and dry. You know, you go through the application process, making sure that it's, it's viable. Um, you qualifying for the event. Do you have the space? Does it fit? Um, are there any other, con other conflicts? You're looking at the schedule. Um, moving uh, the event from, and typically then you'd be putting a hold on, um, and that's a reservation, okay? Um, you know, when you go to confirm that hold, okay, or a definite hold, that means contract has been received and the non-refundable deposit has been received, okay? The tenant hold is just there to hold the date. And sometimes you, uh, you end up with a um, with the ability to uh, release those on your dates if, the, if somebody else comes along. Um, a secondary or a challenge hold, I haven't seen this too often, but occasionally it can happen. Um, in a tentative hold situation, um, another party can come in and go, um, we're going to challenge that hold because we're willing to sign a contract now. Um, and that usually ends up speeding up the contract process um, with, with the primary person who has that tenant hold or the client. And if not, it just goes to the secondary one. Um, and then there's the building that relationship between promoters and booking managers. Um, how to, you know, making sure we don't double book things, execution of events. It's all these things um, work into that relationship between there. Um, contract um, issues. Okay. Um, rebooking an event. Okay. Um, this happens when an act can't go on for some reason. Um, then you have to work in that rebooking, or the promoter would have to refund everybody, and they don't like to do that. Um, so you, you establish the communi communications key there, um, and then you figure out ways to work around that. Um, so when you take a look at um, most contracts that contain a lot of boilerplate language or clauses, um, that's standard language you know, that they use in the contract. Um, so then you can go ahead and kind of work your way um, around that. Um, sometimes they want to change that, and that becomes a negotiating point. Uh, stipulation of event organizers, promoters, and artists. Artists usually almost always include this thing called a rider. Um, it's an addendum to the contract that the artists want specific items and specific times and those types of things, specific things. Um, everything from what kind of furniture is in their dressing room to what kind of food is there. I can tell you, um, I watched um, before I individual M&Ms, individual colored M&Ms. Now you, we had somebody going through and pulling out all the blue M&Ms for a particular artist um, at one event we were doing. Um, so, you know, this is, now you can buy them. But, uh, before that, you could um, back yeah, backwards in the day. You, you couldn't, you know, everything. You know, riders include things like the size of the water they want. Um, if they want six ounce or eight ounce, a particular brand of water. That's what you, that's what you put in there, and they, they specify all of that in what they call the rider, um, which is usually an addendum to the contract of the of the event. Um, event organizers and promoters also can specify specifics of what they want to see. Things like signage, um, you know, um, 
other promotional aspects, access to websites, those types of things. So that wraps up our uh, this um, little quick run of.